My thing is bringing romance back into the fashion industry. Stylish and sustainable. That's the message from ethical fashion designers. Designer Jeff Garner dresses the stars and says it's all about style and being good to the environment. We're based in Franklin, Tennessee. It's an old Civil War town. You can't help but be influenced by your environment. What he's doing as a designer, so connected to this place, that he can be designing contemporary clothes and yet somehow, down deep, they have roots to something else. He was probably born in the wrong century, quite honestly. I used to call him Daddy's little girl. He made the cutest little girl. Yeah, thanks, Miss. <laughs> oh, I had him dressed. Oh. Maybe that's why I do such good dresses now. What do you think? <laughs> I love oh it. Oh my gosh. It's beautiful. It's the way I paid through most of my college was I got a Barbie commercial later. That was funny. It was like the surfer dude Barbie. Blaine Barbie was his name. He broke up Ken and Barbie. Walking barefoot in the sand Making brushes with our feet Hands uh, Me personally, I invested every dime I saved up. You know, I couldn't even afford the gas to get here today. Flat broke. And it's times like that you think, oh wow, maybe I should have taken that big offer that was given to me. I think until you accept that it's a business and not just a lifestyle, it can't work. You should want to make clothes that people want to pay for. You can't compete with H&M. If H&M wants to have Carl Lagerfeld do a week, they'll do more business in one square foot of one store than you can imagine doing in a lifetime. That's who you're trying to compete with right now. So that's a little bit about what I do. So I'll, um, I think William covered the fashion industry very well, but uh, I'll give you a little tidbit about how I got started. Um, basically, I was six years old, stole my sister's Barbie sketch pad, set in my room, and started sketching away. And as a southern boy, a gentleman, it wasn't proper for me to be doing this. I wrestled and played football. And, did all the men stuff, but uh, that's how I started. All my buddies were in the music industry in Nashville, Tennessee. They all wanted me to be in their band. I said, no way, I don't want that life, but I'll dress you. So I jumped on tour buses, started dressing, um, started making clothes for them, and then at uh, 17, I jumped in my Jeep. I was supposed to go to West Point Academy, which is our military academy, um, and I said, no way, I'm not gonna shave my head. And I jumped in my Jeep, drove from Tennessee to California, further so I could get away. And then I had you know, one, one friend there who was an actor, Thomas E. Nicholas in American Pie, and he's the one who set me up in that Barbie thing. So it's interesting, like everything is connected. You never know how something's gonna introduce itself to you. So you know, if I can do anything, I would suggest you know, take opportunities as they come to you. Because uh, I'm not as structured as William is. I just kinda, I go with kinda gut and, um, I'm in the wrong spot. I kinda go with gut and, and I take more risk, I should say. Um, and, and that's how it's led to me where I'm at. So I got in California, went to Pepperdine University, um, and then I started working with a lot of artists out of there. And um, I started working with Barry Manilow, Fleetwood Mac, and Donna Summer. I started touring with them, doing the stage clothing, merchandise. And then I left California, left my job, moved back to Tennessee, said, Mom, Dad, hey, I'm starting a fashion business. Can I move in with you? And that's how it began. So I started. Uh, Doing merchandising for bands is how I made my money. I didn't go. I didn't go out and like William. I didn't go out and get an investor. I said, you know what? I don't want anybody to take my control. My, um, you know, I wanted a purity of sense because what I do is sustainable fashion. Um, so in essence, I use sustainable fabrics. I grow my own plants, do my own dyes. And in the fashion industry, it's not really. They don't see it yet as a money maker. So they see all the costs involved in production. So. You know, these business suits that I meet with in New York all the time, they're just, the first thing they want to do is take, strip that away because it's time consuming and it costs a lot of money. So I said, well, you know what? I believe in myself, so I'll raise my own money. So that's what I did. I started doing tour merchandising for a lot of bands. And on the side, I would design at night. And then I started making one piece at a time, one dress at a time. And in essence, I started building my clientele, started with musicians and moved into actors, actresses. And then I was asked to do London Fashion Week, which is why I'm, I'm here. So I was doing Vauxhall Fashion Scout, and um, that was lovely. And so I had um, my buddy Phil from Def Leppard come out, 
and he played the first show. And my publicist, Courtney, who well knows, uh, she's like, Jeff, you can't, you can't play live music at London Fashion Week. I'm like, yeah, we can. So, um, yeah, I didn't really know any better, and I, I, I ride horses, if you guys can't tell. I was actually riding earlier today in the Cotswolds, so that's my boots, I didn't have time to polish. I got back in Paddington at five. I was like, where's this place, North Greenwich? Where's that? I asked the taxi guy, he's like, there's no way you can make it. I'm like, really have to take the tube? All right. I'm no, I, this is like the second time I've taken the tube, so made it. Um, so I had a horse come from High Park Stables in Lancaster Gate. I was like, I want a horse for my show. And they're like, that's crazy. So I convinced one of my friends to ride the horse from the Lancaster Gate over to um, Freemasons Hall, where they had the show. So I had it out front, had a girl on the dress, and you know, my buddy Phil opened up the show, a little guitar solo. It was brilliant. So you know, all that to say is like, if you have a vision, you have a you know, just shoot for it, and don't let anybody deter you, because there's a reason why you have it. Um, and uh, you know, as a Tennessee boy, I've come a long way from the farm. I didn't grow up in the city. Um, and I prefer the country, but so I, I'm located in Tennessee, but I travel a lot. Like I'm going to LA tomorrow, um, and like William, I work with other uh, design houses, uh, projects like Whole Foods. I work with them. Patagonia is another brand I design for. So there's all these different avenues in which you can, you know, as a designer, that interior design. Um, I do Shanghai Fashion Week. So like Dubai, Shanghai is a growing market. Never thought I'd be there, because I actually went the year before, and I was like, oh, you know, I want to expose China for all this, you know, horrible stuff they're doing. And so, you know, because all the manufacturing there, you hear about it in the news and all that. So I was like, you know, I want to go firsthand. So I got there, I went to Xingtang and all these places, and I, we were doing undercover filming, learning about the denim manufacturing and the dyeing that takes place there. And the Pearl River there just flows like black tar. So. Not to bore you guys with sustainable fashion, but simply like our synthetic dyes are made of coal and oil. So, and it's denim is starch before it's woven together. So the starch sucks all the oxygen out of the water. And then the coal and oil and the synthetic dyes, you know, basically it flows like tar. You can light a match, the whole thing will catch on fire. If you do your research, you study, you know, we used to have fires in the Ohio River and the states when we used to do in our industry and our dyeing there. But anyways, it's all moved over there. So we went there to, you know, kind of talk about it, capture film on it and say, you know, there's, but I don't want to capture it and say, oh, look, they're doing something bad, but say, hey, there's a different way of doing it. So as a country boy, I, you know, like I said, I started in LA and I started going and doing my production there. I got into fashion. I was like, well, I can't even print t-shirts. I can't, you know, my first sample maker got sick from all the, taking in, you know, all the little fine fibers that she, when she was cutting, got in her lungs and she got sick on me. So I was like, wow, there's got to be a different way of doing this. And that's kind of what led me down my path. Um, but all I have to say is that I do Shanghai Fashion Week now because I want to educate and teach and say there's a different way you can recharge the dye vats. You don't have to dump them, you know, stuff like that. So, um, so I've, I've kind of chosen a harder route. Not only, you know, fashion industry is hard enough, but um, we're trying to teach and educate and bring awareness. That's why I'm doing it. Um, so it's not, you know, more or less, it's not for the money or to be a big designer, but it's to bring awareness to gain a platform and say, so that's why I'm friends with Livia Firth and um, Stella McCartney and those guys. We try to bring a different awareness to what's going on in the world. So um, I think I should open up for questions, Q&A. Do you guys have any questions? Because I can jump all the way around, circle back around. So I have a lot of stories as well. If you guys don't ask questions, I'll tell more stories. So Yeah. Prophetic, all right. So. I'm in my 13th year now, um, so prophetic, I wanted something uh, deeper. You know, I didn't want to get into, I mean, obviously fashion can be very fickle and can be very shallow. My first impression, I wanted, you know, a deeper meaning to something, so prophetic, and then I put a K on it so I could trademark it. So there you have it, so. And I started off doing, um, you know, more wearable collections and T-shirts and whatnot, so I would do graphic art and I would do a lot of slogans and prints and whatnot. And that's how it began. So everything had a, I, I, I write poetry as well, so I'd put my poetry on it and that kind of thing. And then gradually it developed into jackets and pants and you know gowns as you guys see now. So anybody else? Yeah. Have you gained your knowledge of how to create a design? How did 
you've gotten out of experimentation? Or sure, my path was a little different. So I went to Pepperdine University, I minored in theater, did costuming. Um, like I said, I started when I was younger doing all my band guys. I would take apart their clothes and be like, wow, you guys are great musically, but man, you're, you're man, you know, denim and t-shirts, no, you know, we gotta match your music with your, your wardrobe. And, Everybody wants to see this vision, and um, so, and then I, I internships. I mean, Williams right. Internships are key. You know, go knock on the door, say I will work for free. I'll work for six months. I'll do anything you ask me. Just please let me in and teach me everything you know. And then you know, say if if I'm good enough, you like me, then I'd love to work for you years after. You know, if if you come in and say I want to be a fashion designer and I don't want to learn for you for a month. And teach me everything you know so I can go off and do my own thing. It's like, ah, well, that's what schools, you know, that's what your education is for. You know, I don't have time really. But if you want to be a part of our house, what, our vision, what we're doing, yes, I would love to teach you about sustainable fashion and you can grow with us. And then, um, you know, but I worked with Calvin Klein, uh, Johan J. Lindeberg, and I uh, just, you know, begged him, please teach me anything you know. And I was a hard worker, you know, I grew up on a farm. So it's up early in the morning feeding the animals, taking care of them, and same thing at night. So. You know, luckily I had a hard work ethic. I think today, and a lot of young people, what I've noticed in the States, is that they'll come in the internship, and I'll do interviews, like William, you get like 10 or 20 a day, and, and so I'll interview like once a month, and I'll say, okay, you know, just sit down, let's go for coffee. You know, and they're all nervous, they're shaking, and I'm just like, all right, and I'm pretty laid back, so I said, tell them about myself, tell it, you know, have them just talk, and um, what you discover is that people expect a lot nowadays. So I'd say go into it not expecting anything, but saying, you know, I'm here for you, you know, to learn, and I just, you know, and I can do X, Y, and Z, and, and like William said, you know, really match what the, I mean, you should know about the collection first before you go in for internship and, and what they're about and that kind of thing, and um, it's funny, I always analyze what they're wearing when they meet with me. I'm like, oh, that's synthetic leather. I, I, I don't think that's going to work. But um, so you know, that's that's kind of the gist of it. It's like really go in not expecting anything at all, um, and you know, display your hard work ethic. I think is key because it is probably the hardest business you could ever go into. Unlike acting and music, which all my buddies are into. I'm like, at least you guys, you guys have one product you have to sell. Like we have to recreate ourselves every three to six months, and then make sure we do it better than last season and then you know we only have x amount of time to sell it and then it's no good anymore you know it's like you know it's it's a hard hard world so um, what, was there a time when you felt like giving up and what motivated you to carry on that? she's asking if there was a time i've ever thought about giving up and what motivates me so actually every season i think about I'm like, can I do next season? So, um, you know, I'm not a, not a structured. So I think the motivation is that I have something to say. And so I look at nature, for example, and I, you know, I'm really sensitive. So like for me, going on the tube, I'm, I'm just like in the back, like, I, you know, I'm so sensitive as an artist. That's why I live in the woods. I literally, I live basically in a barn uh, with animals. Uh, I don't have a TV. I don't, you know, watch the news. I, I'm literally like, I turned off my phone for a month last month. That was brilliant. Because um, I'm so, I want to stay in tune with what's going on in the world. But that's me. That's, that's how I get inspired. So this last season I showed at Paris Fashion Week, first time ever. Um, I was a little nervous because that's kind of, you know, that's the, you're playing with the big boys at that point. So I went uh, to check it out ahead of time, went to the venues, don't, you know, don't know anyone there. And, um, I said, hmm, I want to I wanna, you know, go ride horses. So I went to Fontainebleau, uh, which if you guys know Chateau Fontainebleau is where they originally, you know, all the horses were at. It's like the mini Versailles. I talked to the guys there and said, hey, can, you know, I'd love to do a fashion show here. What do you guys think? They're like, oh, yeah, we love it. We've never done one. I'm like, okay, brilliant. So I go, can I bring in a horse? They're like, you can do whatever you want. I said, okay, I'm going to bring in a mermaid. So I put a mermaid in the fountain and brought in the horse, candle lit the whole thing. They shut the gates and said, okay, Jeff, you know, when you're ready, you can open the gates. I'm like, oh, it's brilliant. So, um, and it was, it was a great experience. But, you know, if you asked me last year this time, I'd say, I, I, I don't know, I don't think I can do Paris. But it just, it just naturally came together. And I can't really tell you how, but if you believe in what you're doing and believe, you know, in the purpose and you pursue it with, 
you know, I sleep four hours a night, I work all the time. Um, you know, it will, it will pay off, definitely. What else? Yes. Um, for a designer, especially a, a young designer, a student, it's very difficult to, you have so many ideas every time that it's difficult to create your own style and to continue with it. Sure. Is it, uh, is it difficult for you, uh, every new collection, even though different than the previous one, uh, keep the spirit, the style, uh, your ideas. Is that difficult? Do you have to every time uh, remind yourself, okay, this collection go in a different direction. I have to keep it in the same style, in my style. Sure. She's basically saying how it's difficult to, to stay, you know, in your own style and in, in what you're known for. Um, I'm a little different. I don't have the black dress. Each collection I do is completely different. I did a, you know, last collection was Da Vinci mixed with Hemingway. So I did all these understructures and they lifted by themselves and, you know, recycled metals and, you know, these beautiful skirts and, and I did a corset out of metal and I put it over my wedding dress and said, oh, that's what I think about marriage and, you know, you know, entrapment, but then you release and it's the ostrich feather wedding gown and anyway, so it, to me, I'm trying to stay true to what I'm listening to and hearing when I design. Um, so when I'm sitting by my fire in my, in my barn, I just sketch and I listen to it. But I think because it's coming from you, it's always going to stay true to you. Um, so I pull not from a modern sense or from traveling, I pull from history. So I'll go sit in the library and I'll study um, and then I'll kind of be in tune with that world and then reapply it. Like the Da Vinci collection, I used a lot of um, uh, salvages silk that was brought in the Huguenots were, were oppressed in France and came to London and then they, you know, did the silk industry and then it was dying off and then Queen Victoria, you know, she was, she did the Plantagenet ball, I think is what they called. And so they required everyone to do the costumes out of that silk to keep the industry alive. So I found the, this old silk and so I put it on my lapels and my gentleman's jackets and built corsets out of it and that kind of thing. So, you know, I think it, it magically comes together when you're open to it as an artist. By the way, you guys are all artists, just want to say. Because this past um, year, I was put in the Smithsonian Museum, which in the States is it's kind of, you know, the museum. And I was sitting there with all these artists, like sculptors and painters and all this stuff. I'm like, what am I doing here, you know? Um, but they chose 40 under 40, 40 artists under 40 years of age. And I was the fashion guy they put in, and I was talking to these other artists, and like, what you create is your art, so it's, it's our canvas. And it took me a while to make that click, you know, because they tell you, you know, on the business side of things, you gotta make the wearable collections and all that, and that's part of it. And don't ignore that side, because you, you won't survive. But, you know, but what you do is, as a creator is your art, and like William, I got you know, I got caught up in somebody trying to want to take my art and make profit from it and then try to take my name. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. I don't see that happening, but good luck. And, you know, it's, but it's interesting. So, you know, be confident in that, that, you know, what you create is, is your artwork. It's funny, I was going through customs from China and the guy was like, what do you have in your four bags? And I'm like, oh, it's, you know, it's my dresses. And he's like, so is commercial use? I'm like, no, I made them all. It's like, you want me to put, on, put one on for you? You know, and he was just like, all right, go on. But it is, I mean, it's what you're creating, so don't let anyone, you know, just tell you differently. So, any other questions? Yeah? Do you create bespoke outfits for people? I mean, celebrities have been in dress room. Do you develop a relationship with any of them? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's interesting. I feel like I'm repeating William. So, but what you find is that they ex the celebrities expect it for free. They expect to wear your outfits and not pay for. They expect the trade of publicity, um, but you develop friendships with them. And then obviously later, like um, before I left, I actually had the guys from Leonard Skinner in there and Billy from ZZ Top, and I'm making them these kind of Civil War frock coats. And you know they'll invite me out to their shows, and then we'll talk, you know, shop, and then I'll make other stuff for them. But for like red carpet stuff, it's always a trade. Um, but with that, you know, obviously. Um, it does help when you do private clients. Like, if 
fly to LA tomorrow and then two days later I'm in San Antonio, Texas and I have a lady there who's a private client. She has me you know, do these gowns for her and she goes out on a horse with her gun and has this 2,500 acre ranch and she goes shooting on her ranch. Don't ask me, but you know, that stuff does help, you know, it pays the bills, it's, uh, you know, you can't ignore it and then it's, you know, they see it as art, so definitely. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I, I kind of, another theme I usually do, and a question kind of theme that's carried out throughout. Um, so I always feel like you can always jump on a horse. Like when I'm in Hyde Park, I'll jump on a horse. And it's good. I love your city here because you can jump on a horse anytime. And it, it gets my head right. So it's perfect. In New York, they'd have got rid of the horses. They only have the carriages now. Sorry, William. And they won't, they won't, I tried to pay them for me to take the horse out, they wouldn't let me, so. But, um, but yeah, no, I always have an influence. And then plus, you know, like I grow my own plants on my farm and we do like Japanese indigo for our blues, marigold flowers for our yellow tones, red matter root. I use my, I had an oak tree that just fell, I'm using the oak bark for dyes. So, you know, to me it's always like, wow, I'm, you know, I love horses, I love nature, so I don't want to make anything that may or may harm it you know, may destroy it. So that's kind of my philosophy. Yes? How long do you think it will take the industry to realize the importance of sustainable fashion? Sure. She's asking how long the industry would take to recognize, import, uh, to shift kind of into sustainable fashion. I, I don't know if it will ever happen. I think what will occur, personally, I think, it's not just an education. I could sit here and educate you all on sustainable fashion, why it's important, talk to you about breast cancer and the linkage and the synthetic dyes and nylon, da 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 But I won't bore you. What happens is, is that you're addicted to cheap fashion, is what happens. So I can educate you, but you're still not going to go out as a student and spend more money on one of my pieces you know, that's, you know, naturally dyed marigold, you know, that, you know, is breathable, doesn't give you cancer, doesn't have carcinogens, but at the end of the day, you're going to be like, I can't, can't eat, or can't, you know, go out, or whatever. So, it's, I think when we can get more people into it, it'll be cheaper to manufacture, produce, and then it'll, you know, I simply want to provide an option. So, I want to give you guys a choice. So, if you do want to save up for a month, and buy one of my pieces or sell McCartney or somebody else that's doing it, you can, you have that option, that choice. You don't have to put synthetic dyes on your body. Um, so that's my goal, but I think more and more designers will start doing that category. And if, you know, it's hard when you have investors as well because they won't really, they won't want you to do formal wear or right now, you know, I think they're pushing for, you know, bridal because it's very popular um, and it's good money. Um, so they're going to look at those categories first before they say, okay, do a sustainable eco collection. Um, but just remember this, whenever you, you know, pay a cheap price, it's not the brand that's paying for it. You guys get that? So it's not, the, the brand's making money. So you got to look behind that and that's where the cheap price is coming from. In the States, since 1995, our um, fashion price points have dropped 25%. Think about that. It's like, how did that happen? Should have gone up, right? So, you know, it's, it's because we've moved over. So we've handled the labor issues, but now it's, you know, they're dumping the dye vats cheaper. It would cost 13 cents more to recycle the dye vats per garment instead of dumping. But who's going to pay for it? Like we have Walmart, Target, like your Tesco, whatever. Are they going to pay for it? No. Because they're going in as a you know manufacturer and saying we need it at this price point. If you don't live on this price point, we're going to take our contract and go somewhere else. So the guys in China are like, oh, we don't want to lose those contracts. That's our livelihood. Blah blah blah. Who blames them, right? So they don't want to pay for it. So they continue to manufacture that way, and then the government kind of looks the opposite way, or somebody gets paid off, and that's kind of the truth of the matter. So it just keeps moving around. Like I said, it used to be in the States, and now it's moved to China, and if it moves from China, it goes to India, and nobody can keep track of it. It just keeps moving around, and then, so in essence, you know, the cheap price point doesn't pay for the pollution that we're, you know, doing. You've had a moment in your career which really put a smile on your face. <laughs> wow. 
I smile all the time. I don't know. I, you know, I, I love what I do. Um, you know, so the passion drives me. The fact that I'm in front of you guys today, you know, this morning I was in the Cotswolds, I was riding a horse across the land. I was jumping trenches and, you know, and then two days ago I was in Paris talking to another student group and tomorrow I'll be in L.A. And, you know, it's just, it, to me, life just presents itself when you're doing what you love. And um, so hopefully I'm, I could help inspire you guys tonight by being here. And, you know, do you have a question? Yeah, she's asking if I follow trends. To be quite honest, I wouldn't know what they were if you <laughs> told me. Because I don't, I don't look at magazines. You know, I probably should. If I had an investor, I'm sure they would be like, hey, Jeff, you need to do X, Y, and Z because it's trending this year. Um, you know, in the States, they have forecasts, color forecasts. I make everything locally. So I don't need to know what's, what's trending because all my fabrics I, you know, I make, all the colors I make. So I can do, essentially, I can do what I want which is brilliant. Um, you know, I'll tell you how it goes. But um, So I don't follow trends. You know, I kind of do what's in the air. But what you find is designers start, they kind of listen to the same things because you start seeing similarities. And it's not like anybody's talking or copying and saying, hey, let's do this this season or whatever. So you can actually see the art kind of, you know, trending naturally, I think. Um, but yeah, I think trends, because they, they're so short-lived, Oscar Wilde said, because fashion's so bad, they have to change it every three months. <laughs> I thought it was brilliant. But back in the day, you, you, you could see me walking down the street, uh, there goes Jeff, he's you know, in his riding boots or his blazer or his waistcoat. You recognize me by you know, what I'd wear like, pretty much every day or every other day. So now it's like we, we chase character, because every season we're, trend, we're chasing trends and we're buying something new, something that doesn't last. And I get when you're a teenager and you're growing, and yeah, that makes sense. But now it's like, don't you want something that lasts in your wardrobe? You know, a jacket that becomes you, becomes this character that, you know, this leather that you wear in or, you know, something like that. So that's kind of how I think. So everything I do, I use, you know, great zippers, great snaps, and make sure it lasts. You know, I, the stitching that I do and everything, I don't cut corners. Um, so that's kind of what I do. So, yes. Sure, she's asking if I've noticed a difference in ethical fashion in, in the last five years. I think people are becoming more in tune with it. Um, just the questions I've amassed now in, in interviews and whatnot, I think people are becoming more educated and they're, they're respecting it now. Back 10 years ago, they looked at me like, who's this hippie guy and what's he doing? So, um, so I, think, I think it is becoming more knowledgeable, whether or not, and in the stores, I mean, you know, it's, it's like this, so in retail, you know, people are going to look at your item and buy it based upon the design, what it looks like. Then they'll look at price point. And then they'll look at the story, who designed it, what's it made of, that kind of thing. And that's just how it's going to be. So, you know, what's happened in sustainable fashion, unfortunately, a lot of the designers that first started off were, were hippies and kind of did box shaped and, and kind of bags. And, you know, it, it looked like what you would consider, you know, kind of hippie. And so, the people that, you know, I'm trying to go after the change leaders, the people that are influential. That's why I do the gowns and that kind of thing because, you know, you put it on a red carpet. We had an Oscar dress two years ago. They got fourth in, in the Oscars in Vogue, you know, as far as the top dress or whatever. And it was dyed with our indigo and it was peace silk and all that. But they didn't put it in there because of that, but they put it in there because of the design. But what happens is it, then it has a voice into, you know, it's like, oh, wow, you can do it this way, and that's brilliant. So, so yeah, I mean, I think, I think people are becoming more educated, and I think sales, it's hard to put a finger on if sales are picking up because of that, um, but more and more people are talking about it, and I see more designers um, beginning a category of sustainable fashion now. So, anybody else? You can ask anything. All right. She's asking if I find being ethical limits my creativity. I say absolutely, because you can imagine I just can't go and pick any fabrics out. I go to Fabric House where you guys like, I mean, it's like Christmas, right? When you guys walk into Fabric House. 
but I can't, I can't do that. Um, but I tell you this, uh, in far as colors, like typically in a synthetic dye, you say I want, you know, this color blue, and you pick out the number and you, you know, put it in the dye vats and he spits it out an hour later, and there you go. In my world, you're like mad science. You like play with the colors, but that's, to me, that's another creative art form because I've discovered some colors that are kind of gradients and uh, which were mistakes. So it's, it's kind of, to me, it's, it's a beautiful thing. So yes, it does limit in certain ways, but then it opens it up in certain ways as well. But in that, I think it, it kind of hones in on what you're doing. So each season, you kind of know what fabrics you're going to work with, even though I'm developing, I'm working like I'm doing a seaweed fabric now, and that's kind of interesting. So it's like a linen. And you kind of learn, like, how do the dyes take, and how does it last, and how does it wear, and how do you wash it? And so that's kind of fun in itself. But yeah, it's, it does limit to a certain extent. But then, you know, I guess it's good sometimes for creatives to be put in a little limitations. Otherwise, we'd never complete anything, right? Um, anybody else? All right. So I guess that's, I'll leave you guys with this. My grandfather always said, he said, Jeff, he goes, he goes even a kick in the rear is a step forward. So I'll leave you guys with that. <laughs> now, I think sustainable fashion is definitely the way forward. Um, we have to rethink things. There's a new generation ahead of us. And, you know, being an artist, I think we have a responsibility. Um, we need to know what we design, what we create, and the impact it makes on the environment. I hope being a part of this exhibition will allow sustainable fashion to uh, develop new legs to be recognized, and this institution will give credibility. Art is not only something you can admire on a wall, something that you can create with and, and you know, inspire to, but it also has a practicality about it, that it can actually um, you know, help with future endeavors and help problem solve maybe um, for, you know, what we have in front of us. Because if we're going to continue to grow as a nation, continue to grow in manufacturing processes, it's very important that we look into that and know that beauty doesn't have to be sacrificed. We can do things differently. <laughs>